Uh, welcome back to the 16th um, Neuromusic Conference coming to you from McMaster University uh, in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, my name is Matthew Woolhouse. I'm an associate professor in music at McMaster where I run a music cognition lab called the Digital Music Lab. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next guest speaker. She is Beatrice Ilari who is an Associate Professor of Music Education at the University of Southern California, where she teaches graduate courses in music psychology, the sociology of music and research methods. She has conducted extensive research with babies, preschoolers and school aged children from the US, Brazil, Canada, Japan and Mexico. In her work, she uses a variety of approaches to study different aspects of musical development and growth of infants, children, and adolescents. Her research is interdisciplinary in nature, as we're gonna hear in her talk. She collaborates with scholars from diverse fields, including neuroscientists from USC's Brain and Creativity Institute, and psychologists and educators from the Advancing Interdisciplinary Research in Singing team, which is known as AIRS, A-I-R-S. She is currently the editor of Perspectives, the Journal of Early Childhood Music and Movement and Association, otherwise known as ECMMA, and serves on the boards of prestigious journals, such as the Journal of Research in Music and Education, Psychology of Music, Music Sciencia, and a relatively new journal called Music and Science, which is edited by Ian Cross out of Cambridge. So, okay, without any further ado, Please press the play button and let's all listen to Beatrice's fascinating talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Before I begin my talk, I would like to take a moment and thank Professor Laurel Trainer and the conference organizers for having me here today. Um, I'm deeply honored to be speaking in this conference about a topic that's very close to my heart. So thank you very much. Um, what I thought I'd do today is instead of um, speaking about one specific study, I thought it would generate more discussion if I shared some of the lessons that I've learned in the last 20 years doing research with children in and from different parts of the world. So let me share my screen and start the talk. So the title of my talk is Cross-Cultural Music Research with Children, Lessons from the Field. And the way I structure this talk is first I want to situate cross-cultural music research today and also um, explain why I think cross-cultural music research with children is so important. Next I will review some recent studies published in the last 10 to 15 years and then discuss some of the challenges ahead of us. And this is where I will infuse some of the knowledge that I've gained in the field. Um, I will conclude this talk by making some considerations for future research and discuss some ways forward. So in 2012, Kate Stevens published a paper that has been very important for many of us because in this paper she reviewed literature on music perception and cognition from a cross-cultural perspective. And so this paper I think offered many clues into areas that um, needed further research. And one of these areas, of course, is research with children. Um, the second um, paper that I think has been very influential was a paper by Joseph Heinrich and colleagues where the authors talk about the need to counter sampling bias in psychology. So this is the famous paper on so-called uh, weird populations. And basically what they were saying in this paper is how psychological research has focused predominantly on white and English speaking populations from industrialized rich and democratic societies and how we really need to look at other populations if we are to understand human psychology as a whole. So these and other works have certainly motivated, um, you know, a lot of new research in cross-cultural music perception and cognition. So we're seeing a lot of interesting papers come out, um, which are, you know, helping to solidify this body of knowledge that we now have. Um, I think the other motivation is how, you know, to think about diversity issues that are at the fore in societies across the globe. So it's about time that we 
contribute even more to an understanding of cross-cultural music cognition and perception and cognition. Um, but why should we do research with children? You know, some would argue that research with children is difficult to do. It involves, you know, specific methods. Children aren't always um, super enthusiastic about some of the tasks that we design, so we have to be very careful about that. They're not very easy to access. They're, you know, children don't go out in the world alone. There's usually some caretaker. They're part of some institution, the family, the school that we need to deal with, and so on and so forth. Now, I would argue that child, you know, studying childhood is challenging, but it's exciting at the same time. First of all, because childhood is a formative period. So it's a time when there's a lot going on in children's behavior, brain, and understanding of the world and in musical experiences. Uh, childhood is also very high on political agendas. So research in childhood has um, applications into the world as well, into education, into therapy, and other settings. Uh, we learn from child developmentalists that development is dynamic, and although we live in the era of the brain and we're learning so much about the musical brain, we know that development is not just the brain, but it's brain, genes, behavior, and context. It's the interaction of all these important um, factors, if you will. And by studying children, we gain much insight into cultural distinctions, innate behaviors, and music universals. So there's this big gap that we need to fill um, urgently. Um, but the exciting news is that there's quite a lot of research already out there and research coming out to help solidify this body of knowledge. And as I was thinking about this talk, um, I was thinking that you know this research could be divided into five different um, types of studies. So the first one is what I call in-depth single and multiple case studies. So most of these studies are conducted by um, ethnomusicologists, anthropologists, um, music educators, uh, sociologists. So looking in-depth at specific cultural groups of children or youth and how they engage with music. So Patricia Campbell has done, published quite a lot on different uh, musical cultures of childhood. Uh, Lucy Duran has a very interesting project that involves you know, a group of musicologists and ethnomusicologists doing ethnographic work with children in different parts of the world called Growing Into Music. And this is available online. So you can see video footage, read the interviews and learn about you know, children's experiences over time in places like Mali and Cuba. So very, very interesting and important work. So this is one type. Another type is what I like to call juxtapositions or comparisons of cultural groups within a region or a country. So these are studies where uh, researchers are looking at different groups within a specific region, like Amalia Casasmas studied young musicians in jazz, flamenco, and classical music in Spain, and their learning styles and cognitions. Um, another example is studies of immigrant children in a specific location, so in Australia, um, as Kathy Marsh has studied, or in, in Sweden and other places. So there's quite a, a large body of works that are coming out talking about these ex musical experiences of these students and youth. A third type of study is comparisons between two or more culturally distinct and geographically distant groups. So these are studies that look at, say, children in Brazil and Germany and how they engage in, specific, in the same musical task. So trying to pinpoint differences and similarities in their responses to a specific music-related task. Um, and I think the, the, the largest body of knowledge that we have or that I could find in children was with this methodology. Um, then we have a fourth type, and it's related to the previous one, which is studies that look at perception or responses to music that is from a different cultural group. So this is, this is a study that really touches on issues of musical ownership, if you will, um, musical identity and issues of otherness. 
So there are several studies um, coming out. There's coming out. One of them is a study by Bainbridge and colleagues where they looked at American infants' perceptions and responses to world lullabies. So this is an example where, you know, they're thinking about perception and also in relationship to issues of otherness. And a fifth group is a group of studies that aim to make some kind of social, use music as some form of, you know, social engineering. Um, so these are studies that rely on musical interventions and the aim is to change people's perceptions or implicit biases or attitudes towards folks of other cultural groups in and through music. So an example is the works carried out by Felix Neto and his team in Portugal, where they looked at implicit biases and children's attitudes before and after an intervention with music of Cape Verde. Um, and there are other studies, but these studies are often carried out by educators, social psychologists, folks in social work as well. So what you see is, you know, five different types of studies. They, again, there are overlaps between them but they all connect these ideas of culture, psychology, music, and children. So all, all of these uh, concept, these topics come uh, connect in some way, but they uh, also represent different epistemologies, different ways of thinking about childhood, about children, about um, where culture is located, so on and so forth. What I would argue is all, all of these studies are important because they help paint a clearer picture of music and cross-cultural, um, you know, perspectives uh, during childhood. Um, now, as exciting as this is, we still, you know, these, these studies are, um, we still have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And here's where I want to share some of the lessons that I've learned. Now, in recent uh, months, two important position papers have come out, one by Brush and colleagues and the other one by Jacoby and colleagues. And what's interesting, there's also an old, some older works um, talking about some of the challenges and things that researchers should attend to as they engage in cross-cultural research. Um, in all of these papers, these six topics come up. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the first four in this talk. So let's start with terms and definitions. So the first term that I think we need to attend to is what is culture and where is culture located? This is very important. And I know that Jacoby and colleagues bring that up in their position paper. So one way to think about it is to look at three different orientations within psychology. So cross-cultural psychologists, for instance, um, they look at culture as something that resides outside the individual, as the separate entity, almost as an, you know, they, they treat it as an independent variable. They use experimental studies, they use self-reports for the most part, and they tend to be very universalist. So that's one way to think of culture. Another way to think of culture is to think that culture resides inside the individual, so in a more contextualist way. And cultural psychologists do exactly that. And they tend to use naturalistic approaches. They tend to look at everyday life. And they tend to focus on in-depth studies of one cultural group. Now, there are comparative studies in cultural psychology as well. But some would argue that the purpose of comparison is really to highlight, um, you know, the, the experiences of one culture. There's a lot of discussion in that, but certainly another way of thinking about culture and where it's located. Uh, a third uh, orientation in psychology is indigenous psychology, and it tends to be more integrationist in the sense that indigenous psychologists think of culture as the system of meanings that is subjectively created, and they like to research folk theories. They, as you know, a starting point um, to develop new theories. Uh, of course, indigenous psychology has a very strong political stance. There's the issue of voice, and there's also, especially in recent writings, conversations about decolonizing um, psychology. So this is one way to think of culture. Uh, there are other approaches that we can think about. And David Matsumoto, a cross-cultural psychologist in San Francisco, he also urges us to think whether our research is really cross-cultural or is it more cross-nation. Um, 
are we just looking at nations and equating nations or a country to a culture, which we shouldn't do. So he says, culture is not a synonym for country. And so on your screen, you see six images. There are images, well, five actually, and one is just a flag. Um, but these five images are images from research sites where I've done my own research in Brazil. And as you can see, there are very, very clear differences just by looking at these images, but they're all Brazil. Okay, so if I didn't know enough about the culture, um, I could, you know, report or, you know, um, represent Brazil in a way that doesn't represent the full scope of it. It's way more complicated than that. So offering thorough descriptions is important and also considering all sources that may produce observed differences between countries is important in the in, in between cultures and in, in when we're doing um, cross-cultural research. So in this case, you know, SES, climate, perception of time, this is very different. So just to briefly illustrate, if you think about the river and population in the Amazon, so right on the top, their sense of time, climate, um, perception of, of the world is very, very different than the perception of folks who live in, in a city like Sao Paulo, which is very fast paced and busy and noisy. And so, these are things that we need to take from, into consideration. Now, furthering this idea of variation within, here's an example of data that I've collected in the field. So for many years, I've been collecting children's songs. So I asked them to do pitch matching tasks and also um, sing their favorite songs. And I had two four-year-olds, um, I had more actually, but there were two four-year-olds who offered to sing Bobo Lechinha, this was their favorite song. This is a traditional children's song. Um, and what you see there is a score as a music teacher would have it, but there are different um, you know, regional variations of the song. Now what you're going to hear is a child from southern Brazil, from a very cold part of the country, um, which is in the city of Curitiba, urban um, center, um, that's predominantly white, that had, you know, different um, European immigrants during the 20th century, how she interprets the song. And then you also hear a child from St. Louis. St. Louis is very, has a very strong um, Afro-Brazilian community. They have very strong cultural life, um, Cambodia Criola, they have their, you know, interesting musical genres um, and practices, in, and they're located in the Northeast of Brazil. So just hear them out and how different they sound. And here's the one from São Luís. No boletinha, eu pra cozinha, fazer mingau para a madrinha, um tico-tico, perna de pau, olho de vidro, para de pica-pau. Okay, so two very different versions of the same song. Which one is more Brazilian? Both. Both are Brazilian. So here's a, a clear example of variation within something we need to consider when we think about culture, cultural groups, and their music. Um, now, Moving on from, you know, definition of culture, we also need to think, what's our definition of, of the child? What is a child? So, and sociologists of childhood have brought up this question, you know, urging us to consider categories that we often take for granted, but that are very important in research. So what is a child? Is a child a miniature or imperfect adult, a special creature living in a special time, an agentic social actor, a biopsychosocial individual, a smaller and weaker member of a community, a protected category, someone of a certain age? How are we defining children and childhood in our studies? This is important because how we define children will also determine, you know, how we want to measure their skills or, or examine or observe them, the methods that we employ and what we consider to be, you know, childlike or not. Um, and the so sociology of childhood also brings up the issue when we think about child development um, and when we think about childhood as a time in life, is it, are they children go undergoing a process of being? Are they in the moment? Are we thinking about children in the process of becoming? 
or is it a combination of both? So where does the sense of time lie and why is this important? Because again, when you're designing studies, when we are designing studies, are we using adult uh, skills as our end goals? Is this, you know, children getting there or are we looking at our data in a different light? So this is very important. And also because there's quite a lot that's being written now about musical childhoods and the musical child. What is a musical child? So here are just some examples from my own field work. So ch these are all musical children in Brazil, um, but doing very different things. So here in the, the Landless Rural Movement, children singing about Che Guevara and Rose of Luxembourg and engaging in a lot of collective and pro-social kind of games. Um, in Minas Gerais, singing a lot of Catholic songs and chants. Um, in the Carimbo in, in the Amazonian re River, lots of dancing going on um, in, in the Carimbo and a different version. The Carimbo is a musical genre from you know, the Amazonian region. Um, same thing, you know, there's a version where they built their own banjos and the kids are learning the instruments and so on. They have their notions of talent as well and, and what counts and what doesn't. Um, a choir in the Marajó Island and where the kids are all dressed as soldiers and in, inside what was supposedly a church, but all covered in colorful fabric. And they're singing political chants from the 1940s. So that's a very different experience. So just something to think about. Now let's move on to the second topic, which is power differentials and ethics. So. The first thing is, you know, in all of in all of these position papers, they ask us to consider the history of cross-cultural research, how it has been rooted in racist capitalist ideas and motivations, also how we need to develop this critical awareness of the larger historical context of things, um, like the history of Western imperialism and colonialism. So important to consider. Why? Because this awareness is a foundation for the study of human behavior. So we really need to think about. So one of the topics we need to consider are asymmetrical partnerships when we engage in cross-cultural collaborations. So just to illustrate what this means is when you think about um, world music, um, ethnomusicologists, musicologists, cultural theorists have talked at length about how partnerships are sometimes uneven. So think of the case of Buena Vista Social Club, which is this documentary film and there's recordings of Cuban music. There's a lot of debate as to, um, you know, who benefited from the partnership? Uh, was it fair? Uh, lots of conversations in that sense. Same thing with Paul Simon and, you know, collaborations with uh, South African musicians and so on. So the same applies to research. We know from our IRB training that research with humans involves power differentials. So there's a certain power that comes with the position of being a researcher. And we have to, you know, be aware of it. We, we are trained for it and we're made aware of these differentials. But the same happens and becomes amplified when you involve culture, different cultural groups, researchers from different places, participants from different places, and also children. So we do need to consider, you know, issues of fairness and, you know, who benefits. This conversation needs to happen as we design studies and as we build partnerships and as we collect data, as we give back to communities. Um, the other piece related to power differentials is the issue of ethics. So here's an illustration of another project that we did a few years ago with my colleague Susan Young and 11 colleagues from around the world. So um, design wise, this was quite a simple study in the sense that each one of us had to find a child who could be our own children. No, well, we wouldn't interview our children, but who would be similar to us. We're not looking at the other, but children who would represent, you know, middle class, could be our neighbor, a nephew, so on and so forth, and interview them, uh, possibly a boy and a girl, um, and talk about music in the home and what children like to do, uh, what were the things that mattered to them, talk to their parents, how much, you know, if they had music lessons, and, and then we shared our data in this wiki that, you know, the project was called My Place, My Music initial, uh, initially. So we all, you know, 
added our data, interviews, photographs, and we shared and we wrote this book and we could all consult and discuss and, and interpret each other's data. Now, what was interesting, what came up in this project was our initial um, IRB approval was from the University of Exeter in the UK. But we had people from Kenya, from Brazil, from Singapore, from Taiwan, from Israel, from Italy. So what would that mean in, you know, in different countries? And what if we had a problem? Who would get to decide? Um, so what we learned with this project, some universities require their own IRBs aside from the one from the, the British University. Others, there, there was no system to even get approval. So how do you go about that, right? There are many, many issues to consider if you're working in multi-sites um, uh, in, in, in this type of, of, of work. So something to consider, who decides? Um, going to the third item, methodology. So I know a lot has been said, but I just wanted to illustrate also how, you know, even when you design something and you're the same contact person and you are, you know, hoping to do the same study in different nations, there's quite a lot of variation that might occur and a lot of unexpected turns. So in studies with, you know, pitch matching and singing a favorite song um, and using music perception tests, um, I've had different experiences working with schools. I'm from the field of music education, so I work a lot in schools. So in first in a study with Japanese schools, there were many meetings that happened with my partner researcher in Japan and the school principals. Then when I arrived with all three of us, and then, you know, lots of document translations, lots of requirements. Um, but the school was ex the schools were extremely organized. And one of them said, okay, you have a space for testing. You're going to have 11 children, 10 minutes per child, no more than that. Then you have to send them back. Um, and what I would like you to do before you collect your data, that you talk to children. And then, of course, there was a translator, which made things even slower. But you have to talk to children. They can ask any questions, and then you can collect your data. So that obviously had an impact on how much data I was able to collect in that particular school. In Mexico, uh, it was more informal. I had a very informal meeting with the principal. There were many changes along the way. Um, they, at the end, there was no time or space allocated for testing, so I had to do it in the classroom and with the teachers assisting. So that brought up other issues um, uh, in terms of data collection, also in terms of IRB and so on. In Brazil, I had several informal meetings with the principals. Everything was fine, um, you know, IRB-wise and so on. They gave me a space in one of the schools with, was the principal's office, which for some children was a little bit terrifying. Um, the time was very flexible, so they said I could use as much time as I wanted. They also designated some children to assist with, you know, picking up children in other in, in the classroom, sending them back, or which created another layer of complication that I had and some issues that I had to solve. And in the U.S., you know, because I guess because the schools are so used to, at least the schools we work with are, are used to research, um, the meetings with the principals are very um, straightforward, very quick. We knew, you know, all the approvals we needed to get, um, the space, the time, everything very organized, and I had research assistants to help. So just to illustrate how different it is, it was the same project, but the, you know, the actual access to children was quite different. And which, you know, obviously impacted data collection. So one thing to consider. Uh, tasks, we need to be very careful. So of course is language. Language is a big issue. If you, if you speak the other language, it makes things much easier. Uh, but you still have to consider, are these tasks meaningful for all cultural groups? Um, in some cases, there might be a trade-off. Do you need to decide, um, you know, if there's an international researcher coming in, is it better to have train a local person to collect data, or do you want the same person doing the tasks, but that person speaks, you know, little or none of the, the native language? So how do you go about it? Um, also remembering that types of verbal exchanges are different in cultural groups. 
Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that the culture of psychological testing is not widespread. So even in my native Brazil, I speak the language. Um, I knew the schools before. I didn't know the children, but I knew the schools. So going back, um, you know, there was a lot of explanation that I had to do to get people to understand that, no, 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 you know, you know your child is not missing a school year because of this. So clarifying you know, what the, what testing really meant, even if the test had been, you know, validated in the country and so on. So that's important to consider. And finally, rating scales. Um, there's a lot of research looking at, you know, the responses of Asians and Westerners, for example, showing that uh, Asians tend to avoid extreme op opinions. So whereas Westerners may, you know, score things all over the map. So how this needs to be taken into account. So these are studies done with adults, but perhaps, you know, I would assume that it would probably transfer to children as well. So something to we need to consider and pilot and and have a better understanding of. And also using, you know, different tasks. So in in, in Mexico, one of the things we did was we listened to world music and the children represented music and wrote about the music they heard. So that was very effective in, you know, trying to understand their perceptions of otherness. Um, the other piece is behavior expectations. So as you know, there's a large body of knowledge on cross-cultural differences in childhood, not in music, but in childhood, um, you know, and so there are a few things that we've learned, like, you know, compliance to adult directives may be different across cultures. Uh, parenting is certainly very different. Um, everyday activities are different. Um, child agency and control. And Mary Govain at UC Riverside in, in a well-known study has talked about how, depending on which cultural groups you're working with, um, there, are imp in the, there may be associations between modernization and children's responses and tests of cognitive skills. So again, the culture of testing, um, you know, the types of tasks that we use, are they measuring what we want them to measure? And the final issue that I wanted to discuss with you is otherness and the musical imaginary. So um, we all have, you know, when we engage in cross-cultural research, we have um, ideas of what the culture looks like, whether we've read about it, whether we've visited before. So we make our own constructions of, you know, or, or um, ideas of these, these cultures. So when I did research in Japan, um, my mother's Japanese, so I grew up listening to children's songs. And this was a project that was motivated by the centenary of Japanese immigration in Brazil. Um, so I had funding from the Japan Foundation and I wanted to collect children's songs and produce something for the Japanese Brazilian community. I thought it would be really interesting to do. So of course I went to Japan and I was ready to listen to, and I was hoping that the children would sing the songs that I heard growing up. But the Japan that was in my imagination was a very different Japan than the one that children were living in. So children sang things like this. children sang the songs from my days so and this is a song I learned with you know from my uh, Japanese collaborator from you know Japanese anime which is very present in the life of Japanese children so it's really important to you know calibrate our expectations as much as we can and to consider our imaginary uh, our musical imaginary as we engage in these studies so you know, and even when we think about childhood today, that's the other thing I want to us to think about is that we need to go beyond a romanticization of childhood and a lot of nostalgia. So I, I've done this also, you know, I've been looking for children singing traditional songs and oftentimes they're singing pop tunes, they're singing other things. So that tells us something about their musical lives. Um, so one example that I wanted to 
also bring up is the case of baby sharks. So in the last two years, a lot of people have asked me about baby shark, what I think about baby shark and why is it important and why are so many children listening to it. Now they have, you know, products and a TV channel and there's so much going on with baby shark and you can see the number of hits um, since Ju June 17th, 2016. So this is the number one song. When you talk to parents of young children, everybody seems to know it. It's year warm, so it stays in your head. And what's interesting is that um, baby shark um, hit the billboard. So it, it's one of the few children's songs to ever hit the billboard. So it does tell us something about young children's music and perhaps not what is, at least as a teacher educator, what a lot of us have in our own imagination. And a last example is that, you know, and connected to Baby Shark is, you know, the, the case of the Jerusalem Challenge. So also when we think about children's music worldwide, um, we think we perhaps immediately think of children's songs and sure children listen to children's songs but they listen to other things as well and i think now in times of the pandemic we'll probably see even more of this but we know that children's music listening is multimodal meaning that children are not listening to records as i was as a child but they are looking at videos on YouTube and other platforms. So the Jer Jerusalem Challenge, what it was, was in January, South African group released a video. You can't really see the video, but a group in Angola decided to um, create this video with the plates in their hands and this choreography and created this challenge. Now, from this, and this went viral on TikTok and other platforms, and so now you have not just adults, but children from all over the world sending their videos. So in South Africa, in Brazil, in the US, and then back to South Africa, a very little one watching the video and dancing at home. So again, as we think about, you know, how do we imagine children's music making in different parts of the world, we need to consider technology and this multimodality of music listening. So to finish my talk, here are some considerations for future research. So as I said to you, I think conceptions of child, childhood, and culture matter and matter a lot. Um, we do need to engage and design um, culturally sensitive studies. Um, so mapping cultures is important. We can read what our colleagues have done for cert certain cultures. They've, you know, done in-depth studies, they've offered a lot of information, that's one way, and if that's in, that information is not available or is maybe quite old, we wanna go back, map some of the studies. So mixed methods might be a good way to go about our research. Um, I also agree with um, Matsumoto and Brush that we need some theoretical justification for choosing research sites and cultures. Why are we choosing that culture? And what is the framework that we're using to interpret our data? Very important. Is it Hofstede? Is it um, Hype Shippers? What, what, what are some of the frameworks that will help us really understand these differences or similarities? Um, attention to rituals of participation. As I showed you, you know, you might have the super clearly designed, well-designed um, protocol, but once you apply it to different places, the rituals of participation may be very different. So I remember in Japan exchanging gifts with the principals. I learned that that was an important part of recruitment. So that's just one example. And of course, collaboration, equality, equity in research. So giving voice and giving back to communities, super important. So what are some ways forward? I think collaboration and transdisciplinary thinking. And I think this is important, not just for us researchers, but also for funding agencies and for people who are reviewing papers and proposals. Um, to conclude and returning to Stevens, at the end of Kate Stevens' paper, she says, you know, raising awareness of diversity might start the revolution for present generations to recognize and future generations to learn diverse musical and cultural forms. So I do hope that this research, you know, will not only add to the body of knowledge and help us better understand ourselves and others, but also will help to counter the divisiveness in our societies across the globe. So here are my main references. I want to also thank the children and their families, my research collaborators across the world. I could never, never have done any of these projects without them. And also 
some people who have always been, you know, discussing with me and teaching me a bunch of things about children and cross-cultural research. Thank you very much for listening. Beatrice, thank you very much for a fascinating and stimulating, thought-provoking talk. Um, I'd like to get this Q&A session uh, going. And I'm going to start with a question from Paul, uh, who writes that I accept your point about the variation of culture. However, with the example of the two girls singing, could the second girl's singing ability be less developed? Or maybe she has, um, maybe she's turned deaf or something like that, mm -hmm. he writes. So um, that's the song which I was think was called Boba Latina, mm -hmm. um, if I get the pronunciation correct. And I suppose it speaks to a, a methodology of analysis of when you have those two performances, how might you go about comparing them in, in a way which is objective versus subjective. Yeah, thank you. So to the first point about um, being tone deaf, that's actually how I actually started doing some of this song collection because I've had guests come over and often say, well, Brazilian children sing out of tune or there are things that are just not right. And what was interesting in that region of Brazil, I had several examples, several, but more than 20 of children singing in this format. So one of the things we did, we looked at Tambo de Criola, which is a type of drumming that they have in that region where, you know, from the time of, um, the, right after um, the discovery of Brazil, or actually the, the, the beginning of um, slavery. And so they still maintain that tradition. And in that tradition, pitch doesn't matter as much. It's much more about rhythmic endurance and also polyrhythmic um, ability. So you have very young children playing very complex rhythms, but when you listen to their singing, it, it, you know, that's not the priority in that, in that genre. So in the, in the second example for me, I don't know, you know, I don't have enough information about the child to say if the child was tone deaf or not. But in that particular group, because I had so many examples very similar in that way, that's very rhythmic. Um, I wonder if it has some um, influence from that. That's the everyday practice. There's a lot of drumming in that region. Um, and in the child in the South, uh, on the contrary, when you listen to the voice, it sounds like a much younger child as well. So there are other issues that you think about socialization in, in the home and in families, whether that has a role as well. Now, in terms of analyzing this, this is where it gets really difficult because, of course, you could look at pitches, you could look at, but which one is the correct rhythmic accuracy? If I go to the Northeast, my colleagues will say, well, that is correct. And if I go to the South, they're going to say, well, yeah, that's how we do it. So this is where I think it gets really tricky. Um, you know, so we have done a little bit of pitch analysis and, um, but I don't know how far we can go as to say, which one is more Brazilian or both are. So yeah. I don't know if I've answered the question, but. No, but I think it's a, it's a very interesting point about, uh, there's a trade-off between rhythmic complexity uh, versus tonal complexity. And it's as if there is a, a, a finite amount of cognitive capacity and if one becomes dominant, if the rhythm becomes dominant, it can sometimes, you see a, a diminishment of tonal complexity and vice versa. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, and, it's, and it's very interesting that it speaks to the historical roots of some of the communities in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, because it opens a lid on historical dimension. And, and music, music is, so many aspects of music are as a form of, of sort of cognitive archeology. span and Absolutely. social archaeology as well. And visiting, you know, the Amazon region, I saw rhythms that musicologists thought were almost extinct. You would see some communities still singing it, but in their own way. And also incorporating things like in the lyric, like in the lyrics, like um, use of cellular phones or Viagra or things that you wouldn't think that people would be singing because they don't have that much access to technology. And this I'm talking about river and co communities where um, there's a, a, a power generator for two or three hours. So they listen to radio, a lot of Caribbean music yeah. coming in. 
because that's how they, you know, that's the influence they have. So there's a lot of that influence coming through. But we found Lundus up there, which a lot of Brazilian musicologists would say, well, that's extinct. It's not. There is some going on. They just need to go up there. Need to get out of the office. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So on to another question from Dorita. Um, mm -hmm. So isn't it necessarily necessary? for clarification, that when defining culture, child or musical child, to identify your working definition of music as it relates to your particular research? Or do you assume everyone has the same definition? What is musical in the child? So what is music that is being illuminated in the child? I think this is an, uh, as important a definition which is, need, which, is as, which is needed as the definition of culture, for example. Yeah, I think, you know, not everybody has the same definition for sure. And and so this is why I, I actually brought that question. And I was actually challenged by one of my colleagues who is a sociologist in, of childhood. So to really think about these categories that we sometimes take for granted, I do think that that has to come across. And sometimes it comes across from, you know, just your methodological approach or your epistemology, it kind of comes across. But I do think it's important. And what is musical in the child? I would, you know, just with my experience going around, I talk about Brazil because it's the one I know the most. But um, in my experience with Brazilian children, it was very different when you asked in the Amazon and some of the riverine populations, it's more about singing. In San Luis, it was about being able to perform for five or six hours, different polyrhythms and, cre and, and improvise. In other areas in the South, with, there's a, an area where the kids sing in thirds. Um, that's what's important to be able to be in tune and to sing these songs and, and it's usually a duet. So how do you um, define there is a very local as you know, very specific definition within different cultures, I think, cultural groups. And this might be within a large country or even a, within a large um, a, within a city or within, you know, the different um, spaces we're in. It's very hard to pinpoint, I think. Um, Obviously, with the advent of COVID, um, music uh, making in isolation has uh, grown hugely. Mm -hmm. um, but do you find that uh, there is a, a strong connection between the degree of community music making and socioeconomic status? I'm just thinking about you know complex cities uh, where communities can often be fragmented versus rural communities. Uh, which often engage in collective activities. Um, Not just I think music making, but of course, uh, other activities associated with the survival of the group or collect, you know, or, or collective activities which benefit the whole group. Collective harvesting, for example. I think I think in some places that you know people are just using a lot of their ingenuity to really find ways to make music. Um, and I know that, for instance, to the naked eye, for a lot of folks, they say, well, now you just put people on Zoom and they will all make music together. And we musicians know it's not that simple. But I think people are finding ways um, to continue with some. And of course, there are places when they're, they're not observing social distancing. So there is some music going on. Yeah. But there is. And the other thing that we are seeing, um, I have a former student and, and colleague who's doing research with parents in the home today. And she is finding that there's quite a lot that parents are doing. They're using music in all, all sorts of ways to you know, engage with their family. So more, it's a smaller unit. That That's a, another thing I've been hearing that people are have these smaller units where they, well, there's that friend I can still play with, or we can still sing, or we can still find ways to connect in and through music. So I think there is some some going on. Um, we'll figure out how that's gonna go after the pandemic for sure. But from my Brazilian sources, what I hear is that, you know, there is something going on, but in sometimes smaller groups and some, and some people are just not observing social distancing, which is a, another problem, but. Um, so, uh, interesting question here from Rachna, um, and do you think that these musical differences within a country are related to language dialect differences as well? As I think they, they could be related to s some language dialect, sure, but I think a lot has to do with historical and also the different groups, in the case of Brazil specifically, because it's so... Um, um, 
multiracial, a uh, mixed race, you know, you have, and you have so many different groups within the regions. People are very proud of, of these regional differences as well. So what's being maintained and what's being left out, but of course, culture is very dynamic. So this is why I wanted to bring, you know, baby shark and other things because they're listening to baby shark too. And they're making, and so I have versions of people playing it like kind of like a samba version of baby baby shark for their kids but it's still baby shark so there's that um you know the dynamics of culture i think there's language and there's also the historical piece that's important i uh, strike me as being something of a, a polyglot um how many languages do you actually speak beatrice and how important is is your knowledge of different languages in your research would you say well properly i speak three um portuguese spanish and english but i you know i learned a little bit of german i living i lived in montreal for years that's where i went to grad school so i learned some french and it's closer to so i think language does help in japan that was a bit frustrating i think the fact that i couldn't communicate directly and it was always through a translator for me that was that was quite frustrating so learning the language is always you know language is, is a, a window into identity into culture into so many things i think uh, indeed so, Indeed, absolutely. Uh, so um, a question from Prissa, how do you give back to the diverse communities and cultures through your research? I'm interested in who benefits when you work with minority cultures and marginalized groups? Yeah, that, that's, that's always a tricky question, isn't it? Because we, you do want to give back and a question that have, has always been on my mind is, you know, what is a song worth, right? So I, I've heard people in, in in my career say, well, you know, I just collected a song and it's just a song. No, it's not. For that culture, it's part of their, um, you know, their history, their traditions, and it's part of who they are. So um, in the projects that I've engaged, what I've done is I've um, in, in communities like the landless rural movement, for instance, I asked them beforehand, well, this is what I would like to do. What would the community like? And they said, well, we need school supplies. That's something we don't have. This is a very um, un uh, underserved community in some ways, but um, because they have their own um, plantations and they, they take care of, you know, they have their own, um, they live in, a, in, a, in, a, in the lands that they've occupied over time. And so they have, they live in a very communal home, very socialist, if you will. So they plant and, and of course the youth, they want to leave. They don't want to stay in the community. But uh, one of the things they said, well, we need school supplies. There were other places when they said, well, we would like you to record our music and give us, you know, recordings. So things that we can perhaps sell um, during carnival or other events. So negotiating with communities, I think is the way. Okay. Um, so what about comparisons across cultures in how young children are exposed to music, both informally and formally? Uh, what has your research revealed about this? Formal so, music education in children versus informal community gathering processes. I think, you know, um, a lot of the, the research that I've done is in, through schools or preschools and the cultures are different, you know, how, so it, it it speaks to conceptions of child, of course, but even how schools are oriented and organized and and where music fits in, whether there is music that happens, say in Japan, there was a lot of music, recorded music that played during recess. And it was interesting in one of the schools, it was all synthesized music throughout recess. So 30, it was, I think, 25 minutes. So you'd hear this twinkle, twinkle, little star over and over or some classics like uh, Beethoven's Ninth the theme and then it would just go on and on like in a loop so that it you know recess was quite noisy in a way because you had that music and had the children in the background but they had music classes uh in brazil in some schools you don't have any music uh going on going in the in the curriculum but you have kids making music and in all schools i've seen kids sing in the in playgrounds and you know, engage in musical games. So that's, and Kathy Marsh has written a lot about that, you know, the playground music, there's quite a lot going on. And that I did see as well. Um, but again, the question of whether there are music lessons, how music is treated and how, you know, these societies value music or where they want their children to be musically, I think it will also impact, you know, whatever data you collect, at least that's what I've seen. So on how much teachers will correct kids or how much is just imitate what I'm doing versus, 
just saying, okay, well, that's cool. Let, let's, you know, build from what you've done. Yeah, I think this, this highlights a very important point. And, and that is that no child is in a bubble that can be studied um, in, an, in a sort of hermetically sealed manner. And uh, I, I think uh, that has to always be taken into account. And I think that's something uh, which came across in your talk very clearly that we, we, those of us who work in music psychology often conveniently forget. Um, anyway, just we're coming towards the end of this Q&A session, but there are a few more questions which have come in and one's from Laurie. Uh, and that is, have you found differences or similarities in the function of music in childhood across different cultures? Yes, the answer is yes. So there's, you know, music for playing, music for soothing um, rituals in the home, even, you know, in places where parents say they don't sing, they do, they do use music in some way, form or shape with their kids. Music for rocking, for dancing, for entertaining, for um, social cohesion, for sure, or for building groups and for building identities so that for sure that's something i have seen um it's just that the music itself might be different but uh for sure i've seen that yeah i think it's uh that's a very interesting because it because it speaks to the motivation for making music mm -hmm. um if it's connected in some way to larger social norms traditions expectations that are put on the child or whether it's an isolated activity. In yeah. other words, is, is the musical activity rooted in some other broader function? Or is it just, okay, now it's it's music time. And uh, which is one of the problems of music in the classroom is mm -hmm. that somehow it's, it can be somewhat disconnected from, from people's lives. Um, I guess that's one of the things that the benefits of mobile technology is that people can take their musical identities with them. Uh, maybe that's a bad thing. Who knows? <laughs> okay. Um, so just a couple more questions. Um, so Paul, who you, you answered a question from Paul earlier in the session, uh, but he has a follow up one. Uh, you mentioned the challenges of studying children. Are you aware of the large body of guidelines that are available um, for studying new medicines in children uh, as they are useful learnings here. Are you aware of the large body of guidelines that are available uh, for studying new medicines in children? Uh, I guess the, he, it may be an ethics thing that Paul's getting at. Um, are, the, are these guidelines going to be useful? Because obviously they're probably they're extremely strict. Um, would they be useful for studying music and um, the way music is, is administered to children? Well, I will, I, I'm not, I don't know this particular document. I will certainly look it up. But I think, you know, that this conversation of ethics is really, really important you know, something to, as we saw in that project, okay, we didn't have any problems, but what, what if we did? Right. So who gets to decide and how do we go about it internationally, either in Kenya or in Singapore or in Brazil or in the US? How are we going to go about it? So I think this is important to consider, especially because children are considered a protected category in, you know, in the research that we do. Indeed. And a last question from Stephanie. Uh, within the cultural differences upon uh, minorities, um, has there been evident differences between biological genders across the board within the culture? So um, obviously we're interested in culture, but what about the biological differences between genders? Do you notice uh, strong uh, trends here or not? Well, one of the things that we have found, uh, so this was a study we did with, uh, again, pitch matching singing um, with kids. We found that, you know, the same thing that girls that were singing more than boys and were more willing to do the tasks that we were and a lot of boys in both countries here and in, in, in Brazil were saying oh I don't sing that that's for girls so that that association between singing and um, I don't know if that was exactly the, the, the question if that's where the question was going but you know this association we did find um, the attitudes were similar in different places so between you know 
biological boys and girls. Um, yeah, of course, there's, there's obviously a little of genderization of, of children in different cultures. Some cultures places place stronger emphasis on it than others. And that's bound mm -hmm. to have a knock on effect in the way that music is used um, and attitudes towards music and therefore musical competencies. OK, I think that wraps up our Q&A session. Thank you very much indeed to Beatrice uh, for a fascinating talk and a great Q&A session and all to, also to all of the attendees who've, who've written questions. I do apologize if I didn't manage to get to your question, but we had a lot of questions coming in. Uh, it's just uh, for me to say that we now go into the poster session. Um, I believe that the tech support is going to post the link in the chat to the poster session. So it's gonna be easy for you to navigate there. There are over 45 posters. Most of the posters, I think, will have a live um, person associated with them discussing their work. So it's a great way to interact with um, the people who've put these posters together. Um, I know many of them are students, graduate students. My lab um, graduate students have been busy, for example, uh, putting together their posters for this. So please do check out the poster session. And then that's followed at 1.30 by lunch where you'll be able to interact with the panelists. Okay, so once again, thank you very much indeed, Beatrice, for joining thank us. Thank you very much. Talk, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>